Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Allison B.A. I'm the Executive Director of the Goldfarb Center, and we are so pleased to welcome you to the uh, George Mitchell Distinguished International Lecture. It is such an honor to have you all here. And we have an incredible mix of people with us. We have community members, we have students, we have campus leaders, we have faculty. We are just so glad that so many people can join us. And President Green, we're very happy you're here. And so many members of the Mitchell family, thank you for joining us. At the Goldfarb Center, we are a hub for innovative public policy conversations, and we provide students with opportunities to interact with leaders and practitioners and ignite learning and discussion opportunities that are cutting edge and dynamic. We aim to inspire students to be civic leaders while striving to foster collaboration, bringing together diverse perspectives to tackle society's toughest problems. For the Goldfarb Center, tonight marks the start of a year filled with engaging programming and multidisciplinary collaborations on emerging issues. We hope this will be the first of many evenings you join us for. The Senator Mitchell International Lecture was launched in 2005 by members of the Mitchell family and has a legacy of bringing powerful voices to campus, including United States Senators, Secretaries of State, and many other prominent dignitaries. Tonight, we are fortunate to again welcome a statesman and international leader, Ambassador Robert Gelbard. He has a reputation um, for a... <laughs> I know, I was like, Patrice, I better be careful with this reputation piece. <laughs> he is a trusted international leader, and we are honored to have him with us. We are also so pleased that the ambassador's wife, Aline, is with us this evening. Like her husband, she also has, as you will learn, four decades of international experience advancing social and economic development. She's also a former member of the Board of Governors of the Colby Museum of Art. Both of you, welcome. We're so happy you're here. Our topic this evening is the threat to liberal democracies across the globe. Last spring, the Goldfarb Health Center held a number of events addressing the challenges to American democracy. But we all know that these challenges extend far beyond our borders. We are at an inflection point as many countries and international communities face ex increasing extremism and growing authoritarianism. These international challenges impact our own democracy and our own communities. Senator Mitchell well understood the relationship between international and domestic affairs. He spent his entire career as a dedicated leader, leader and groundbreaking diplomat who repeatedly made contributions at the domestic and international level to strengthen democratic institutions. He is a role model for civic leadership, renowned for his diplomatic expertise, as well as his sincere dedication to developing the next generation of leaders. Although the senator could not be with us tonight, we are very grateful that he took the time to send us video remarks that we will watch shortly. But before we hear from Senator Mitchell, I want to say just a few more words about our keynote speaker tonight, Ambassador Gelbard. As many of you know, Ambassador Gelbard is an esteemed alumnus and trustee emeritus of Colby College. After graduating from Colby in 1964, the ambassador began a career in Bolivia in the Peace Corps before spending more than four decades working in the State Department at various high-level positions. He has served as President Clinton's Special Representative for the Balkans, Ambassador to Indonesia and East Timor. Ambassador to Indonesia, oh, excuse me, but so many ambassadors, ambassadors, so many, so many countries. Ambassador to Bolivia, Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere's Affairs. He also served as a member of the Obama-Biden Presidential National Security Transition Team. And honestly, there are more. I just I couldn't include them all. So there's so many things that the ambassador has done and held positions in at high levels of government service. Now, while the ambassador's professional accomplishments and accolades are very impressive and certainly reflect his deep intellectual power, those who know him well speak first and foremost of his character. Ambassador Gilbard is known for his integrity, his leadership and his commitment to fostering the next generation of civic leaders, just like Senator Mitchell. The ambassador is legendary, I have learned, at Colby for meeting with students, students who you know, actually not just want to work in the Foreign Service, want to do anything. He says yes to every student. That is a lot of yeses. Ambassador, 
It is a pleasure to have gotten to know you, and I am so pleased that you agreed to be our 2023 George Mitchell Distinguished International Lecturer. You, both personally and professionally, are a role model for our students and our community. Now we will watch uh, Senator Mitchell's remarks, and then I will briefly come back and invite the ambassador to the stage. Good evening. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person this evening, but I'm pleased to join you through this video. I have many fond memories of Kobe. I was born in Waterville and grew up on Front Street near the old campus. I and other local boys watched many baseball and football games there, and we used the fields ourselves in the summers. Later, I worked summers on the construction of what was then the new campus on Mayflower Hill. I recall one summer when I built the terraced lawn in front of Foss Hall. To this day, I check the grass there whenever I visit Waterville. My father worked as a janitor and a groundskeeper at Colby. He loved the college and took pride in taking care of its grounds and facilities. It helped him fulfill his dream that his children would get the education and the opportunities in life he never had. Winston Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others that have been tried. He made an important point. Democracy is so difficult that its virtues are most apparent in contrast to other forms of government. Democracy is a recent innovation. Throughout most of history, governance has been based on power and heritage, and it was often violent. During the millennium before the birth of Christ, the city-states of Greece made the transition from dictatorship to oligarchy to democracy. The word is a combination of two Greek words, demos, the people, and kratsi, the rule of. In historical terms, Greek democracy was short-lived. Nearly 2,000 years later, it emerged slowly in England. Late in the 18th century, England's North American colonies gained their independence and the United States of America was born. In the nearly two and a half centuries of its existence, it has become the dominant world power and as Franklin Roosevelt put it, the arsenal of democracy. During that time, democracy has spread to many but not all parts of the world, often in very different forms and practices. In our lifetimes, the challenges to democracy have grown and are further complicated by several intersecting crises. There are far too many for me to discuss in these brief remarks, so I will mention just a few. Humans first appeared in Africa about 300,000 years ago, but they grew in numbers and spread around the world very slowly. It was not until the 19th century by our calendar that the world's population reached one billion. The most recent, the eighth, was added in just 20 years. This has contributed to a second factor, climate change. Fed by population growth, and the results of the Industrial Revolution and then the technological revolution through which we are now living, the Earth is warming at an alarming rate. The pace of change has accelerated with both beneficial and negative effects. For example, mobile phones are highly beneficial. We all have one, but they're also used effectively by terrorists and many other criminals, pluses and minuses. And no area of technology has advanced more rapidly than that used by humans 
to kill other humans. In less than two centuries, we have gone from swords and single-shot muskets to nuclear weapons. For the first time in all of human history, the power exists to destroy all life on Earth. I could go on, as could each of you, but this seems an appropriate time to ask, what can we do about these and the many other problems we face? And how important is democracy to that response? I believe democracy is indispensable to an adequate and effective response. Among the most successful businesses in the world are Apple, Amazon, and Google. Apple was created by Steve Jobs, whose father was born in Syria. Amazon was created by Jeff Bezos, whose adoptive father was born in Cuba. Google was co-founded by Sergey Brin, who was born in Russia. I ask you two rhetorical questions. Would America be better off if they had not been admitted into our country? And what do you think the chances are that Steve Jobs would have created Apple if he had lived his life in Syria, or Jeff Bezos in Cuba, or Sergey Brin in Russia? Genius knows no boundary, no race, no ethnicity, no religion. It can be found almost anywhere that humans exist. But it tends to flourish where there is freedom, education, opportunity. The future of democracy here and elsewhere is not predetermined. Wisely or not, here it will be decided by Americans, and the same is true elsewhere. As we decide, I hope we will keep in mind two realities. First, life is constant change for every person, for every society, for every government. And in human affairs, there is no perfection and no permanence, because all of us are fallible as are all human institutions, including, and perhaps especially, all governments. Finding effective and fair governance is especially difficult in the highly partisan and charged times in which we now live. Americans have a special responsibility as citizens of a large and long-standing democracy that has endured for nearly two and a half centuries and for the past century has been the dominant world power. We have had many successes, but we also have made many mistakes and had many failures. Despite all of that, even in these rancorous times, I believe the United States remains the most free and open society in the world. Martin Luther King said that the arc of history bends toward justice. He was right, although he might have added, very slowly. I am hopeful and optimistic about our future. I believe we will rise to these challenges as we have in the past. Our greatest challenge is what it always has been, to live up to our ideals. We believe that every child in America should have good health, good education, and a fair chance to go as high and as far as their talent and willingness to work will take them. But we all know that is not yet the reality. It remains an aspiration. Our challenge is to lift our efforts to the level of our aspirations. It is now my honor and pleasure to introduce our featured speaker. We are very fortunate to be joined by Ambassador Robert Gelbard. 
his diplomatic career under several presidents of both parties is legendary. He literally spanned the globe. He went from Paris to the Balkans to several assignments in South America, to Indonesia and the Philippines and all across Asia, and then to leadership roles at the State Department in Washington, D.C. He served our country and the cause of democracy with great distinction. He is a proud graduate of Kobe and served for years on its board of trustees. I'm pleased and honored to take part in this lecture series and to present to you our featured speaker, Ambassador Robert Gelbard. I would love to invite the ambassador to the stage. And after the ambassador's remarks, we're very grateful that Patrice Franco, Grossman Professor of Economics and Professor of Global Studies, will join for a conversation uh, and questions from the audience. And Mr. Ambassador. What do I say after that? <laughs> <laughs> President Green, members of the Colby community, distinguished guests, it's an extraordinary honor to deliver this year's Senator George J. Mitchell Lecture on International Affairs. As a Colby alumnus and as someone who has been in Washington for decades, I want to stress how much Senator Mitchell stands out to so many of us as one of the great statesmen of our time. He is both a great leader in American politics and the successful negotiator of the seemingly unattainable Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. As someone who has negotiated or tried to negotiate agreements in other difficult areas, including the Balkans, Indonesia, and Haiti, I'm even more of a great admirer. Senator Mitchell also contributes so much to Maine, including through the Mitchell Institute. My heartiest congratulations on his 90th birthday last month. I also had the great pleasure of meeting Bill Mitchell and other Mitchell family members in July. When I came to Colby at age 16, I knew very little. Unfortunately, over the next four years, almost all of my professors agreed with that. <laughs> I graduated, but barely. Very importantly, though, what I did get from my Colby education was learning how to learn, how to think critically which have been essential throughout my life. Democracy is a relatively new phenomenon in the arc of history. There is a constant conflict between both values and people who want democracy, the rule of law and fundamental rights, versus those striving for top-down control and rule through fiat or through autocratic capture, as the political scientist Ruth Ben-Ghiat has called it. As you are well aware, we are in the midst of a global existential struggle over these issues and political systems. Whether it is reflected in totalitarian Russia's savage invasion of Ukraine and Putin's effort to restore empire, the new Chinese government policy of attempting to spread its party over all institutions and opposition to universal rights internationally through its Global Civilization Initiative, the violent stifling of nascent human rights and democracy movements in Myanmar, Niger, Sudan, and theocratic Iran, the autocratic capture of the state and its democratic institutions in Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Hungary, among many others, recent military coups in Africa, or in the efforts of those who would undermine and overturn our own elections and democratic institutions in the United States, we are clearly at an inflection point where we must all be involved. As a new Colby graduate with no international experience, I joined the Peace Corps and was sent to Bolivia, 
a dramatic discontinuity from my previous life in Waterville and Brooklyn. Within three months, I witnessed a military coup, the overthrow of the democratically elected government. Not having any frame of reference and watching tanks and troops patrolling the streets, I was stunned and shocked. And those circumstances had a dramatic effect on my future views, career, and life. We generally take for granted that democracy is the norm, the usual way of life. But it is not, and it has been far from that. Democracy is a relatively new phenomenon historically. Democracy is not solely free and fair elections. Elections are necessary but insufficient conditions for a democratic state. Too many countries are described as democratic after an election. As we are well aware in our own country, elections and those involved with them are under attack, as in many countries, and they must be protected and the results respected. Elections are the start, and a critical start, but only a start. The true essence of a democracy, in fact, is its strong institutions. Democratic systems can vary significantly based on culture, history, and tradition of a people and a nation. But I believe that at the core of any and all democracy is the justice sector the broadly defined interactive set of institutions involving the courts, the police, the prosecutors, and all the other components that must work together to ensure the rule of law and protect fundamental rights of all citizens. The rule of law is at the heart of any democratic system, and the courts must be independent. Citizens need to know they can successfully seek redress, whether against their neighbor or against the government, and for investment and job creation to occur, there needs to be legal certainty for contracts to be fulfilled. Two other essential buttressing and fundamental democratic institutions are civil society and media. These are basic elements in the construction and maintenance of democracy to cajole, to criticize, and to support as needed. The private sector also has an essential role to play. But all of these are pointed to the fundamental tenet of democracy, which is that the rule of law and its fight against corruption, the most corrosive influence against democracy, must be handled. In all nations, Corruption is the accelerant that fuels the weakening and destruction of democracy and its institutions. Constructing a strong, lasting, and effective justice sector is the most difficult element of the democratic process, one that takes the greatest societal political will, resources, and patience. After the U.S. and other nations intervened in, 19, in Haiti in 1994 to facilitate the return to office of the militarily ousted but democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, I was involved in both the planning and implementation of it. The U.S., Canada, and France conducted effective training for the Haitian police, but it was completely undermined by Aristide's, Aristide's co-opting the courts. The bad result was the police taking justice into their own hands when the courts were corrupted. Similar efforts to corrupt the judiciary and other elements of the justice sector and undermine democracy are taking place in a disturbingly large number of supposedly democratic countries which purport to have strong functioning democratic institutions, including Israel, Poland, and Hungary to name a very few. Plus, as we all know, this has been happening right here in the United States. Accompanying this are concerted and massive disinformation efforts to discredit and undermine the legitimacy of the justice sector, which have proven disturbingly effective against the courts, against the prosecutors, 
and here, even against the FBI. Those who do this, particularly in our Congress, defy the Constitution's separation of powers and open themselves up for possible criminal charges. These days, we often hear the term illiberal democracy to describe countries such as Poland or Hungary, which hide democratic, non-democratic practices behind formal democratic institutions. I will tell you, I really dislike the term illiberal democracy. It's an oxymoron. These are countries that are not really democracies anymore. The result has been a dramatic loss of confidence in institutions, both democratic and others in our own country and throughout many others around the world over the past several decades, all of which has led to a great reversal in the global trend to establish democracy, creating the most serious undermining of democratic systems seen in decades. Polarization and extremism have increased dramatically, not only here, but in many nations that previously had broad-based coalitions, such as Chile as a current disturbing example. The trusted and longtime Latin American polling group, Latino Barometro, consistently shows that far and away, the most trusted institutions in most of Latin America are the military and the church. Why has this occurred? First and foremost, as we see in the United States, in many European nations, in much of Latin America, Africa, and elsewhere, the overall predominant reasons are fear and unmet expectations. Expectations that were often unrealistically set by political leaders. There are important segments of populations that both fear and have difficulty adapting to change. But change is inevitable and now seems to come much faster than in the past. The challenge for leaders and for institutions is management of change, perceptions, and very importantly, expectations. Loss of confidence in democratic and other societal institutions has come about for a variety of reasons. Growing economic and social inequality, for one. Job loss and workforce restructuring as industries relocate, or the inability or unwillingness of the workforce to adapt to new industries and technologies. Resentment of immigration and falling industrialized countries' birth rates. Increases in women and minorities in the workplace governmental and legal mandates for minority rights, concerns about citizen security, unrealistically high expectations that politicians often create as a means to win office, massive and organized disinformation campaigns against democratic institutions, and again, corruption, which erodes, undercuts, and destroys institutions and people's confidence in them. And I'm certain you can list many other factors. All of this has been exacerbated and accelerated by the dramatic and sharp global increase of authoritarian populism. This is not a new phenomenon. Think of Huey Long in the United States, of Mussolini, Hitler, and Perón. But with the added factors of rapid global communications, and especially social media, Demagogic vitriol and disinformation provide sensory overload in ways never before imagined. Globalization has many benefits, but also important negatives. Collaboration between totalitarians and authoritarian populists has now become easy. Hungary's Viktor Orban and other European far-right parties cross-fertilize as they do with the American far right. Former Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro worked closely with Donald Trump and Orban. There has been unexpected but a stunning rise in the far right parties in Sweden, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, and elsewhere in Europe. 
Their allies in this are Russia and often China. Russia's relentless disinformation apparatus works to discredit democracy as it did in our own 2016 election in efforts to support sympathetic parties and candidates. Authoritarian populists play on and attack the vulnerabilities of democratic institutions. They attack the legitimacy of the justice sector when there are increases in crime, often calling for extra legal solutions. They use massive disinformation to attack election processes, eligible voters, and results. They use corruption as a pervasive instrument to undermine society and its values. They flaunt impunity from justice as demonstrations of exceptionalism, and they are prepared to utilize violence when their resort to democratic means fails. Today we see burgeoning efforts to confront, undermine, and replace the traditional concept of democracy, as well as to impede democracy building. Alliances, both formal and informal, are developing, aimed at attracting nations away from more efforts to build democratic systems in favor of constructs which range from authoritarian to totalitarian. Taking advantage of disillusionment in Africa and Latin America, where international assistance and trade have been less than promised and have diminished, where leaders have not met expectations and democratic institutions are weak, the lure of authoritarianism, whether through a series of military coups, as we are now seeing in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, or civilian authoritarianism in Latin America, has immediate attraction to many. The West often fails to understand and help support these countries sufficiently. This leads to easy and dangerous attractions whether the lure of China's usurious Belt and Road loans or, or Russia's Wagner Group filling a short-term perceived vacuum until the bill comes due. This points to a failure by the West and multilateral institutions to assist these nations appropriately and sufficiently in political, economic, and social development. United States policy in the post-World War II era has emphasized a theoretical belief in spreading democratic principles and values. The Marshall Plan and its political and economic support for Western Europe stands out, as well as the U.S.'s significant political support for the establishment has what be, of what has become the European Union and subsequently its expansion to include Central and Eastern European nations. In practice, however, the United States often, in the past, not only failed to follow through, but betrayed those principles out of Cold War and post-Cold War fears of communism and other national security reasons that produced historic mistakes and catastrophes. Important examples, in my view, our support for the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran in 1953 in favor of the Shah, which eventually has led to the current authoritarian theocratic state. The 1954 overthrow of Guatemala's democratically elected president, Arbenz, from which Guatemala has never recovered. And the 1973 coup against Chilean president, Salvador Allende, from which Chile fortunately has rebounded and returned to a strong democratic model. I also consider the 2003 Iraq war to be perhaps the greatest foreign policy error in our history, a war of choice based on utterly false intelligence and stunning incompetence in its efforts to build a democratic Iraq. I would like to think though that there is a maturation or greater sophistication in foreign policy that has now begun to evolve. In a complicated world, complicated and dangerous world, pragmatism in geopolitics continues to be and must be, must be 
a major factor in the foreign policy of the United States and every other major nation. Even if this means not being as true to our values and principles as we would always prefer. President Biden's trip to India last week for the G20 had the additional purpose of showing strong support for Indian Prime Minister Modi. Not entirely a paragon of democratic virtues, even though India is considered the world's largest democracy. He went on to Vietnam to bolster the bilateral strategic relationship in a country which is an out-and-out -out dictatorship. U.S. policies toward Mexico and Central America have unfortunately been overwhelmed by migration, which means domestic policy priorities. All this said, though, the United States policy's primary emphasis over at least the past 40 to 50 years has been increasingly true to our values and principles. Democracy building and support for human rights in the Carter administration were disparaged by many, but continued to build, if not always consistently, through the Reagan administration and then through succeeding presidencies with the exception of the previous one. The Agency for International Development and its international and multilateral counterparts make democ democratic institution building one of their highest priorities. The National Endowment for Democracy started under Reagan and its four associated organizations work alongside European political party counterparts along with private non-governmental organizations, often the recipient of government funding to help train and advise countries around the globe as they work to build their own justice sectors, independent media, and civil society. Make no mistake, this is really difficult. Democracy and institution building are a long, arduous process, especially in nations with little to no democratic tradition. The international community often makes the tragic error of having a short attention span and moving on to the next crisis rather than staying the course. Ultimately, though, the countries involved and their leaders must lead. They must demonstrate the political will to develop their own democratic system once offered a framework of opportunity by the international community. My 35-year Foreign Service career began more or less traditionally, but the second half of it changed dramatically with emphasis on dealing with conflicts and wars, conflict resolution, and support for countries going through democratic transitions. A few examples of my own involvement. Earlier I mentioned the tragic and appalling support by the US government for the overthrow in 1973 of Chile's democratically elected Allende government. Chile is a nation with a proud democratic tradition one of few in Latin America. This coup, led by General Augusto Pinochet, reinforced others in the region and led to a horrendous period of dictatorship and massive human rights violations. As Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South America, I had the great fortune to work for Secretary of State George Shultz, who strongly supported us in a complete change of US government policy, which I led supporting Chile's democratic opposition and working successfully to convince several members of the governing military junta to split from Pinochet to help in what became the return to democracy. Prior to the current terrible war by Russia against Ukraine, the worst conflicts in contemporary Europe were the horrifying wars in, form in the former Yugoslavia, including especially Bosnia and Kosovo, but also Croatia. I was deeply involved for four years, the latter three of which were as President Clinton's special representative for the region. Today, after Yugoslavia's collapse and the tortured transitions these countries went through, there is distinctly mixed news in democratic development, ranging from greater progress in Slovenia and Croatia, positive movement in North Macedonia Kosovo, Montenegro, and Albania, 
to Serbia's autocratic capture status and Bosnia's continued paralysis. The US, the EU, and the rest of the international community have devoted massive human and financial resources, but ultimately, the countries and peoples involved must show the will to advance. After the Balkans, President Clinton asked me to go, in 1999 to go to Indonesia, which was in a state of political and economic collapse after ousting General Suharto, its 32-year military dictator, and suffering the consequences of the devastating 1998 Southeast Asian financial collapse. Additionally, extremist Muslim terrorist groups, including Al-Qaeda, had taken root. There was, however, a vibrant, if small, civil society, newly free media, and a developing political class. The US and others in the international community assisted Indonesians in vast and extraordinary ways as they redeveloped their country, which is now, only 24 years later, not only the world's fourth largest in population, but also the third largest democracy and the sixth largest economy and one of the fastest growing in the world. Indonesia is by no means a perfect democracy. There are serious concerns about press freedom, for example. But given its history and lack of any democratic tradition, it is one of the most undertold success stories of democratic development. I have spoken a great deal about the challenges the world faces in perilous times. What can be done to confront, oppose, and defeat authoritarian and totalitarian forces bent on overturning and replacing democracy? First, to have credibility with their own populations, governments need to recognize and find new capabilities to manage new threats to their security beginning with climate change and public health crises, and increase efficiency in communications on what they're doing on all. Similarly, enhanced or new multilateral mechanisms must be established to foster much better cooperation, both qualitatively and quantitatively. As I already mentioned, there are strong efforts internationally by governments government-sponsored nonprofit organizations, such as the National Endowment for Democracy and private organizations. These programs need to be bolstered considerably. The US played an important role in assisting Chile's no, mo no movement, campaigning to oppose continuation of Pinochet's dictatorship. Their leaders, in turn, then assisted Serbia's Otpor in successfully overthrowing Slobodan Milosevic's sociopathic dictatorship. This form of international cooperation and transnational linkages must be bolstered. Civic engagement at all levels of society is fundamental and essential. Citizens must be prepared to engage to support democracy. From such grassroots examples as school boards, and election observers to the national level. Similarly, as has been discussed often, civics is a critical element for education, which is now less taught globally than before. We must demand its mandatory inclusion in curricula and include it as part of our international aid. Corruption. The international and domestic fight against corruption must be increased and accelerated. It is nourishment for anti-democracy. An international effort in which I am involved focuses on the establishment of an international anti-corruption court, which would fill the crucial enforcement gap in the international framework for combating grand corruption and kleptocrats in nations where such prosecution is impossible. This idea has begun to gain considerable international support. For example, the Labour Party in the UK now endorses it, although unfortunately not from the United States government. As another element to fight corruption, there needs to be a much more urgent, deeper, and broader effort internationally, possibly through the OECD, 
to eliminate havens for kleptocrats and dictators to stash their stolen funds and dark money. While a good deal of attention has been paid by the US and some European governments focused on some areas, the Pandora Papers in Panama revealed numerous havens for foreign trusts here in the US, including South Dakota, Wyoming, Florida, Texas, Nevada, and Delaware. While we focus elsewhere on this critical issue, such as the UK and Malta, we must also act to clean our own house. The global struggle over political systems is ongoing and will continue. Disinformation, corruption, the promotion of polarization and extremism and violent force are powerful tools used by those who fear democracy and systems based on the consent of the governed. We are also in a new era of non-traditional global threats, including climate change, pandemics, and ongoing social and economic inequality that must be addressed seriously if democracy is to survive and prosper. The struggle for establishing and consolidating democracy is ongoing. There is good news. We often forget how Taiwan has transitioned in a half century to become a model democracy. As I mentioned, Indonesia is an important example of systemic change in one of the largest countries in the world. Little Mongolia is changing politically, economically, and fighting corruption under its young Kennedy School educated prime minister. In Europe, the Baltic states, emerging from Soviet domination, are important democracies as are Moldova and the Balkans nations I mentioned. In Latin America, Brazil and Colombia withstood serious democratic threats. In Africa, the African Union and ECOWAS have begun to take action against military coups and their leaders. And in a clear signal, the G20 just added the African Union as a permanent member. Senator Mitchell, in an interview he gave last month, declared his ongoing optimism about the United States. But even more broadly, he said, life is changed for every human being, every society, every government. While his views have much greater weight than mine, I strongly share that optimism as I do about our common global future. Every night, Aline and I drink a toast to democracy. I believe fervently in democracy and in people's desire for the fundamental rights freedoms and responsibilities that democracy entails. Achieving and maintaining it has always been hard work and will continue to be, so we all must be involved. Thank you. And welcome to the stage, Professor Franco, to join in a conversation with the ambassador. Uh, th our Professor Franco may be only second to the ambassador in her support of students, as I have learned <laughs> being on campus. So we are very grateful that she is here. And I invite you both to sit down for some uh, conversation and questions from the audience. Ooh. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, before we turn to some of the amazing points that you've raised. I just want to turn to the audience because this is such a special moment for Colby and the community. The Mitchell Lecture, like some of the other lectures that the Goldfarb Center manages, brings together this, these thoughts, brings together our sense of democracy on the ground. And so thank you to the Mitchell family and friends of the Mitchell family for being here. It's super important. This, this is where democracy begins. And thanks to the, the students in the audience. Following this, if I'm correct, right, there'll be a reception in the back. And you can ask Ambassador Gilbard anything, and he will say yes. So <laughs> maybe. <Say> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. You always say yes to students, right? I'm a Dodgers fan. How about that? <laughs> Dodgers fan. So. 
we have a limited time for questions at this point because we do want to get to some of the conversations. And I'll be calling on folks. And as some of you know, if you don't have questions, I'll call on you anyhow. But let me, let me open by taking you back to Chile for a second. You seemed a little bit more optimistic than I am today or this week. I don't know if you had the chance to read the Emeritus Quarterly, a, a piece that I know we you're read very the same much. Things. Yeah, because <laughs> he sends them to me. No, <laughs> some of them, because I can't afford them. Um, I need more money. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we all do. But the Americas Quarterly is a great um, journal that I know the ambassador has been instrumental in, in supporting. And they reported some very disturbing numbers this week, right, where they said in response to a question that the military was right in carrying out the coup, or the military was right to carry out the coup in 1973. In 2013, that question, only 16% of the Chilean population said, yeah, the military was right to do it. And 10 years later, just 10 years later in 2013, 36% of the population of Chile, as the ambassador has so rightly characterized as a successful Latin American case, study say that the coup was the right thing to do back in that time period. So I wonder if you could talk about two things about that. One, one is, why is that happening, right? Because it's not the kind of authoritarian populism that we see in other places. And what could we do as an international community to begin to support the government in, in that way? For years after democracy returned to Chile, there was a group, a political coalition called the Concertación, which center left, which governed and governed pretty effectively. Um, but I think several, several things have happened. That coalition has split. Um, Expectations, I talked about expectations. There have been unrealistically high expectations that have been created by political parties and by the left, which is governing now, about the future that they have been unable to meet. They drafted a new constitution which was overwhelmingly defeated by the population. Uh, and there's a new effort to write a new constitution, as you know. There's also been a big problem with citizen security. Uh, crime has increased in Chile, which is not traditional. Um, and the economy has not done that well. They have not been able to move that much beyond um, exporting raw materials and some agricultural products. products. So economic growth has only been about 2%. And that's really resulted, I think, in, in the, this kind of disillusionment on the part of the population, particularly with the expectations. What worries me enormously is that the leader of the, I mean, the, the traditional opposition is, has been to the right, but now it's moved to the far right. Sound familiar? And the leader is a man named Kast. I'm not making this up. His father was a Nazi officer. Um, it's really true. And, I, and he has very much talked about a return to those kinds of values from the Pinochet era. I remain optimistic about Chile, strongly optimistic, um, but it takes work on the part of the government. I also like the young president, Boric, who I, I think has done, is, is learning on the job pretty inexperienced, and he is um, changing his government, putting in more moderate ministers in some of the key positions, um, such as particularly dealing with crime. So I, I, I remain optimistic. Should the US keep a distance? Um, I think the, 
there's not that much the United States can do. The Chileans are fully capable of taking care of this themselves. Um, and I think they will. Yeah. Well, Ambassador has laid out this landscape of changes and geography. I have a lot of questions. But let me just turn to you all for a bit here, because we are short on time. Are there questions from the audience here? Hi, Tom. There are mics, and if you would introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, Tom Morioni, uh, previously uh, employed by Colby as a sociologist for a while, 45 years. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between um, anti-democratic forces and nationalistic rhetoric uh, in general. And I wonder if you could talk about that generally from what you've seen historically happening and what we might look for um, globally in that regard. Thanks. There's a spectrum on which nationalism exists. There can be healthy nationalism, but there are too many cases, obviously, when nationalism goes into a real danger zone. Um, looking, for example, at the former Yugoslavia, uh, which was um, horrendous in terms of a kind of nationalism which developed and produced the worst kind of violence and mass murder imaginable. Um, we're seeing right now in Russia's um, war against Ukraine um, a perverted form of nationalism. And part of it is Putin's magical thinking about trying to create, recreate empire. Um, and part of it, and this has nothing to do, by the way, this has nothing to do with NATO's expansion. It has everything to do with Putin's imagining himself as Peter the Great or, and, and trying to rebuild the Soviet Union, which he called the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. He really did say that. Um, so na nationalism can and too often veers into a real danger zone where it produces dramatic violence both internally and externally. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a global problem. It's a truly global problem. Um, we see it in our own country, of course. Let, let's come over here. <clears throat> While you're, and, then, and then over there. Yeah. Please introduce. Hi, I'm Willa. I'm a junior. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about how you think that countries are often too quickly categorized as democracies just because they have somewhat free elections. And I'm wondering if you think that our foreign policy has been or it, like is currently, um, like in regards to democracy building and democracy assistance, do you think it's too focused on elections and not on more um, like foundational aspects of building democratic institutions? Or do you think that like as a country we've done a good job with that? As I said, elections are a necessary but insufficient condition. You have to have elections. It has to be free and fair elections. But the hard work comes after, especially if it's the first election. I mean, too many countries, it's, it's, it's one election. Um, the hard part comes after that, as I said, in terms of building the institutions. And this is, as I said, it's really hard. Uh, it requires not just massive resources, but it requires tremendous commitment on the part of the nations involved. I think there has been a serious change internationally understanding the need to do that. Um, it's lazy to just buy into having an election and walking away. But that too often has been the case. Um, but then the question is the resources and the commitments that are necessary 
often for generations, and I, I, I literally mean generations, um, to help build, sustain, create tradition. I mean, building a justice sector, building a judiciary, building law schools, prosecutors, um, police. I mean, we have trouble with building police. So th this is really, really hard and takes tremendous commitment and dedication. It's, it's, it, it's, it was very interesting to see how difficult it was to get multilateral institutions like the World Bank and some of the regional development banks to commit to getting involved in things like training judges. They didn't want to touch training police because uh, that's dirty in some ways. Well, if you just train judges but not police, you've got a mess on your hands. Uh, so it has to, as I, say, as I said, it's interactive and has to work together. But um, it's ultimately, it's going to be the justice sector which protects the elections after that first one. So the mic yes. went back there. I have the mic here. Were you calling on me? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Joe Wishcamper here. Um, I'm curious what your view is for the, for the outlook for democracy in sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly in South Africa, and just wondering if there's any reason at all to, to be hopeful. Um, Africa is, I think, one of the regions I really know less about, although I was director of Southern African Affairs for a couple of years and directed the imposition of sanctions against apartheid South Africa in the mid-'80s. Um, there's been real disappointment in the post-Mandela period, as we've seen a variety of presidents who have not risen to perhaps the impossible level that, that he provided. I certainly had more higher expectations for Ramaphosa right now. Um, but there certainly also has been a breakdown in terms of some of the fundamental democratic institutions that they know need to be bolstered not just because of citizen security, but also because of investment and keeping the economy moving in a serious way. I'm an eternal optimist on these things, uh, but I think South Africa and the ANC are going to have to confront themselves and look in the mirror, and perhaps there needs to be some shifting within political parties before South Africa can realign itself in a, in a positive way. Mr. Pacia, sir. You, uh, <coughs> can you tell everyone who you are? Some of us do know, but. <laughs> oh, who am I? <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Harold Pacius, citizen. Nice. Uh, <coughs> you, talked about autocrats attacking institutions and tearing down uh, uh, the, the institutions of democracies, which uh, I thought was a, a very important point. On the other hand, uh, would you agree that questioning and being skeptical of American institutions, of all institutions, uh, is a very positive thing? And this occurred to me when you were talking about the four or five greatest mistakes that you used as examples that the United States has made in the area of foreign policy. And I think you would agree that the CIA was the implementer of most of them, including with Mossadegh. And uh, questioning the CIA or the FBI without destroying the institutions, would you want to comment on the degree of questioning versus the degree of preservation of uh, an institution. I, I feel very strongly that it is, it is imperative to continue to question 
and, and criticize. That's the essence of democracy uh, in every country. Uh, that's the role of civil society. It's the role of people. It's the role of the media. I mean, we need to keep doing that. When we stop doing that, we're done for. I mean, as for the CIA, remember, they're not autonomous. They work for presidents. And in the case of whether it's um, Iran in 1953 or Chile in 1973, they were acting on behalf of presidents involved. Um, I've worked very closely with the CIA, very closely. And just as there has been, I think, some shift in political orientation about democracy, about um, what's really in our interest in terms of our own national security, um, at the top, there has been in national security institutions, including CIA. But I worked extremely closely with them in the Balkans. Um, the, Bal the CIA Balkan task force would come meet with me every week. I had two CIA analysts in my office providing um, material to us. Um, we worked in lots of ways. Um, I worked with them very closely in other parts of the world, and I, I have very, very close friends uh, to this day who, who were in the agency. Um, it, it's often been a question of leadership from the White House and from their own leadership. William Casey, who ran the CIA, was not one of my favorite people. Um, could tell you stories. Um, <laughs> but in contrast, William Burns, who is running the CIA now, somebody I've known for decades and worked with very closely for decades, a foreign service officer in the State Department, um, is somebody who is extraordinary. Um, and if there's any justice in this world, maybe he'll be the next Secretary of State. I think I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to ask the last question here, and I want to bring it back to your comments about disinformation. One of the Colby students that you have said yes to again and again is our alum, Lisa Kaplan, who Just exchanging has, emails with her this morning. Just exchanging. So Lisa, interestingly, was one of the founding members of the Goldfarb Center, the student board and became active in an incredible fundraising campaign for Haiti. So your work lives intersected in some strange ways early on, back when Lisa was just here. And Lisa, some of you may have met, has launched a firm, the Alethea Group, that combats disinformation. I know you've been a counselor and an investor in her investor. firm. <laughs> right? um, she's had a great support. And I tell this story because I think it's important for the students to know the way the Colby Network goes out of their way, stretches. But what are you learning about the power of technology right, to combat disinformation, to really tell a positive narrative of democracy, not just to uncover what's wrong, but how can we think about new ways of communicate, communicating that might help people improve their views, the credibility of, of believing in democracy again? I think disinformation is one of the most challenging, difficult problems that we are facing now and will continue to face. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, the United States government, Willa and I were talking earlier about um, the Global Engagement Center in the State Department that's trying to deal with some of these issues. Um, there are other countries which are much, much better than we are at this. I mean, I will, I will also say, if I ran the world, I would get rid of social media. Um, <laughs> I'm not on social media. <laughs> I think this is just... Yes, I understand the benefits, but it's just. Um, 
And I'm glad Senator um, Mitchell didn't mention Elon Musk as one of those great immigrants. Um, <laughs> um, there needs to be much greater focus at higher levels in dealing with disinformation, both in terms of governments and in terms of um, the private sector. The, there has not been nearly enough within the United States government, not nearly enough, and we have allowed, and I really mean we have allowed, Russia and China to overwhelm us with disinformation. I was just reading that China is spreading massive disinformation, that the Maui fires were spread by US military weather weapons. And this is just all over the place. One example. Um, Russia is doing this all through the world. Um, they, um, in Serbia, the media have been taken over to a very large extent by the Russians. Um, and by their disinformation. So this is something which we are going to have to figure out in a much more serious, concerted way. The effort started now uh, within, um, or it's not started, but it's being accelerated within the State Department by Jamie Rubin and his colleagues, including Willa's mother, um, is, is important but it needs to be broadened and deepened massively, massively. Um, but I worry about this tremendously. Yeah. A little more than Voice of America's <laughs> we need. Well, and that's been cut back. Right. I mean, Voice of America has been cut back dramatically around the world. I mean, that's garbage. It needs, if anything, to be increased dramatically. BBC has been cut back dramatically. And that's, that, I mean, in a, lot of, in a lot of parts of the world, particularly in Europe, people trust the BBC more than the Voice of America. Uh, although the Voice of America, I, I think, is outstanding. But the BBC has been cut back, and um, that's, that's also damaging. Well, I see Allison coming up to conclude. But <laughs> as you do, poised, right? As you do, as, as Allison stands up, Stand up. And where's Erica, too? Because this is such a big thing to pull off. And this is their first Goldfarb Center event, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Look forward to so many more. Yeah. Always the pro, the former executive director of the Goldfarb Center, showing how it's done. Thank you very much, Patrice. Um, I, we went a little long. We could have gone another 45 minutes. I know there's so many questions. We do want to have time. We have reception in the back for people to uh, get to meet the ambassador and to talk. I do want to, again, thank the Mitchell family for being here and for making sure this is all possible many years ago. Um, I want to thank the Goldfarb Faculty Advisory Board, most of whom are here. Thank you so much for coming after a long day of teaching. Um, and. Really, to the students, I think you've heard it from everyone on the stage, but we are so happy you're here. We are so excited to be part of your future and help you see your path as you move forward in your career. So please join us. And thank you for the pitch you didn't know you were giving, because this winter, the Goldfarb and Davis um, Institute for AI will be teaming up to do an entire series on disinformation for the next presidential election. Ooh. So <laughs> we look forward to that. Um, once again, to the Gelbards, thank you so much. And please stay and enjoy our company and reception. Is that all right? Thank you. Great job.